in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you today here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church. Most certainly appreciate your presence. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during this hour we can be an inspiration to you. And you out in the radio listening audience, we appreciate it if you just call somebody right now. Get on your phone and call someone, especially a shut-in. Have them to tune in and get this hour coming up, and we'll try to be a blessing to them. That way you'll be doing them a favor, be doing us a favor, and we appreciate it so very much. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 17. I'm reading from Luke chapter 17 and Luke chapter 21. Turn there in your Bible, will you please? While you're turning there, I've been asked to make this announcement. If you're in the category known as the the Anarch group, that is, if you were born uh, in 1917 through 1921, then unless there's a change made, pretty soon you're going to be receiving, I understand, maybe $100 less in your Social Security when you reach 65 because of what they call the Anarch group, the Anarch years. And that's the year 17, 1917 through 1921. If you were born in those years, then if you want to do something about it, you need to write your congressman and let him know that you want something done about it. It's really unfair to people born in those years. They're going to draw about $100 less than what other people would draw in their Social Security. And so you get in touch with your congressman and let them get something done about it. They tried to do something about it uh, some time ago in Congress and the bill died. And now they're going to have to resurrect it or i introduce a new one, but something should be done about that because the unfairness of it. And uh, you know who your congressman is, so write him. Let him know your displeasure about this thing, and maybe they'll get something done about it and be fair to everyone. Now, Luke chapter 17, I'll read there first of all, beginning with uh, verse uh, 26. Before I start reading, I want to say the singing and the message will be on cassette tape as usual we always uh, tape our sunday morning programs and they're available on cassette tape and for you that's listening out in the radio listen audience if you'd like to write in for these tape you write in and send a gift for the broadcast and request the tape we'll try to get them in the mail to you and if you're not getting our daily broadcast if you to the station where you're now listening at 12 noon, Monday through Saturday, and get the daily broadcast. I trust you'll do so and tell your friends and neighbors about it. And let me hear from you. This is a faith ministry. The lady in the meeting stood up last week over there in Honey Path and told about her dad, an elderly gentleman, unsaved, but he began listening to our radio broadcast. And every time we'd come on there thereafter, he said, I want quietness, nobody disturb me, I'm going to listen to Preacher Edwards. And he kept listening to the broadcast until finally he got under such conviction that God saved him. And it wasn't long after that he went on home to be with the Lord. So you never know how much good is done through this ministry. And we covet your prayers and you pray about it. And God lays upon your heart to help support this work financially. Be appreciated. It is needed at this particular time. If we was it, I wouldn't tell you. And my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is a zip code number. Now getting to Luke chapter 17, beginning with verse 26, As it was in the days of Noah, so should it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage unto the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now turn with you please to Luke chapter 21. I begin reading with verse 20. Luke chapter 21, turn over a couple of pages there in your Bible. 
And Luke chapter 21 and verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, and all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, under the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and waves rowing, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things began to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Now I've read you some very timely scripture. I'm speaking to you on this subject, what meaneth all these signs? Now we read about some things that God said would happen in the end time. And the harbinger of these things are right now here. We know the foreshadows, the tribulation period is here. One of these days the rapture must take place. And, and then uh, all of these things will be literally and minutely fulfilled. But we're now entering into the uh, foreshadows. And some of these things are taking place right now. We know that without a shadow of doubt that proves we're down near the end of this grace age. Now let's mention first of all some of the signs in heaven. He said there should be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth's distress of nations. You know recently our scientists have discovered some spots on the sun. They talk about flying saucers and the unusual weather we're having today. I believe with all my heart that the unusual weather we're having today, these volcanoes, these earthquakes, is a sign of the end time. Now it, it's been the driest this year. It's been in some 53 years or understand. Now you can hardly predict the weather. You don't know when it's going to be hot or cold seemingly. And you don't know when you're going to get any more rain. And how long the dry tracking and waving and the sea is rowing. And we're just about down to the end. This old earth is stood about all she can stand. And one of these days God's wrath is coming upon the earth. When God lifts his people from off the face of the earth. Don't be surprised at the signs, at the weather, and the things that you see going to happen in the end time. Some of the great changes in the weather may be shocking. It's shocking already. And you're going to see more of it as we move toward the end. There used to be a time when the farmers knew when to plant and what time they could harvest. But now that's unpredictable. Because they don't know how long the cold weather is going to last in the spring. Or how long the hot weather will endure on into the winter. And these things are changing mightily. And that's a sure sign that we're moving toward the end. As certain as I'm speaking to you here this morning. And then we come to something else. What meaneth all these things? How about the inventions we have today? We have some terrible inventions. Some for good and some for bad. And that's predicted in the word of God. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 4, 12 and verse 4. But thou, o Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, dear people, we're there right now. We're living right now in the end time he was talking about when he said, Many shall run to and fro. Now, look at the means of transportation. Just a few years ago, seemingly, I can remember some 50 years ago when uh, I rode up and down in front of this church out here on this highway in a wagon or on a buggy, in a buggy. And there, that's only been about uh, 55 maybe years ago or something like that. When you didn't see many automobiles traveling up and down the highway, you saw wagons and buggies and so forth, carriages. But look at that change now in the past 45, 50 or 60 years. And the change in transportation. Look how long it takes you now to get from America over to England. Just a short period of time. You can leave England, eat breakfast in England. You can fly to New York, 
You eat breakfast in New York again, you can fly to California and eat breakfast again out there. See, that's transportation we have today. Doesn't take long to get around anymore. Now, that's a sure fulfillment of the Word of God here in Daniel chapter 12, where it said, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. If Jesus Christ has his coming 25 more years, if you're still alive on this earth, I'll tell you it's going to be shocking and amazing at the inventions that's going to take place during the next 25 years, barring a great war, worldwide war upon this earth. Now things are coming. Our great scientists and, and men of great learning are now busy inventing and discovering new things that's already here. They're just discovering them. And there'll be some things invented in the next 25 or 50 years that you wouldn't hardly believe if they were mentioned here this morning. If someone had mentioned the TV back many years ago when we had no TV and uh, somebody would have said, well, you can sit in your living room and, and you can watch uh, something taking place over in England or Germany or any part of the United States, you'd said, I don't believe that. I think that would be impossible. But look what's happening today in that respect. Inventions. And then you have the fast moving vehicles, the automobiles. The prophet Nahum said in Nahum chapter 2 and verse 4, he said, The chariots shall rage in the streets. They shall just so one against another in the broad ways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like lightnings. I believe that's a prediction there of your fast moving automobiles and your super highways we have in the land today. Nahum the great prophet back in the days whenever they used the oxen to plow with and rode on camels made this prediction about the end time and told us what will be happening now in this day in which we live. How about your television? You have that in the word of God. Back before I ever saw a television set or ever heard of one, I was bringing a message on the book of Revelation and I dealt with the scripture. Not that I'm smart. I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible said. I said to the people that's coming a time when you can sit in your home and view something many miles away. That time is coming. And sure enough, it wasn't long until the TV was invented. And there you have it. It's mentioned in Revelation chapter 11 verses 8 and 9. Speaking about the two witnesses of dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And there the people, kings and tongues, and nations, plural, shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Now that's the verse of scripture I used. I said by some means or another, people from all over the world will be able to take a look at Moses and Elijah, lying dead over there in the street of Jerusalem. They'll be seeing them from all over the world. And that was before TV came on the scene because I knew according to the Bible something had to be invented that that might be possible. And you see it's happened, no problem. And during the tribulation period when Moses and Elijah comes back and kill there in Jerusalem, the bodies will lie in the street and the reason that will happen is because the Antichrist and the beast will want these bodies to be in plain view of the TV sets all over the world for a certain period of time. They want the whole world to know and be sure that these tormentors, that their tormentors is put to death. They want everybody to see them. And so there'll be no problem now with means of TV. I tell you, it's appalling today at the hours spent before TV sets by young people. Did you know the average young person today when he graduates from high school, he spent some um, 12,000 hours in school. He spent 15,000 hours looking at a TV set and he's seen 18,000 murders on his TV screen during that time. You see, that's why we have so much crime in the land today and so much evil. That's why I thank God for schools like Athens Christian Schools, where a Brother Cummins is headmaster out there and he and his good wife doing a wonderful job and other great uh, church schools is doing a good job. I thank God for them. Many of our high schools are in trouble today. Now permit me just to read a little something to you. I clipped out the sword of the Lord and I'm just going to read uh, just a few uh, lines here that came out in the uh, sword of the Lord here a week, uh, last week I believe and it's alarming. Now you listen to this. This has to do with our high school students. And I quote said the top offenses in public schools of the class of 1940. Class of 1940, I want you to get that. These are some of the offenses 
that happened in our public schools in 1940. Now here's what they were. Talking in class, chewing gum, making noise in class, running in the halls, getting out of turn in lines, wearing improper clothing, not putting paper in the wastebasket. Now that was the top offenses in the, uh, the, the school of 1940, class of 1940. Now let's take a look at what's happened over America in the class of 1983. And by the way, last week, whenever out in California, when the, the high school students came to school on the very first day, there was a gang warfare in the schoolhouse and they started shooting it out with guns. High school students came in, one gang didn't like the other gang and they brought real pistols, guns, and they started shooting and about three innocent people were hit by those bullets. See, that's happening in the high school. That happened, I believe, last week, a week before last in California. But here's the class of 1983. I'll give you on a, on a part of it. In the class of 1983 were rapes, robbery, assaults, burglary, arsons, bombings, murder, suicide, absenteeism, abortions, vandalism, extortions, drug abuse, gang warfare, venereal disease, pregnancy, and so forth, and much more I could read to you that I clipped out of the sword of the Lord. But that's enough. That's enough to blow your hat in the creek, brother. Now you listen to me. Our schools are in trouble. As certain as the world today, our public schools are in deep trouble. You, now they chase teachers around in the classroom and try to jump on them and whip them. Back when I was going to school, we wouldn't dare to even talk back to the teacher. And if we received a whip in his school, we got another when we got home. My mother and daddy said, son, if you get a whipping in school today, you're going to get another one when you get home. And I got another one when I got home. Because I had two little brothers that ran on ahead of me and I got home before I didn't told on me. And they knew it by the time I got there. So I got the other whipping. And now, if some teacher tries to correct a student and has to lay the last of that student and the student goes home, in a matter of a few minutes, here comes Ma and Pa as mad as a devil coming down there wanting to fuss and cuss the teacher out and fight the teacher and carry the teacher into court. That's why we have so much trouble today in our schools and among our young people. I have read you only a portion of the class of 1983. I have the other information right here. And that's terrible, that's awful, and it's getting worse all the time. We are in deep, deep trouble in our public schools and colleges in America day, today. We are headed toward the end, dear people. The only thing that's going to help us is an old-fashioned Holy Ghost revival of the coming of Jesus Christ. Now we move on in our line of thought, and that is the atomic bomb was mentioned in the Bible. And now we have nations with the atomic bomb. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come the thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the enemy shall melt with fervent heat. That's exactly what that bomb does, the hydrogen bomb. In Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 12, another prophecy, And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouths. They tell us that's exactly what happened when those two bombs were dropped at the close of World War II. Now that's going to happen again in the end time. They're going to start bouncing these atomic bombs around in the end time according to the Word of God. And these things are going to happen. We live in perilous times and momentous days. And we don't know what we're going to hear or see whenever we get up the next morning after you go to bed. Terrible things are happening now. There's ill will among nations. That's in the Bible. I read that in the text. The Bible says in Luke chapter 21 and verse 25, And upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. That word perplexity means confusion. And there's never been a day when we've had so much confusion among nations as we have in the world today. You know that is true. People can't get together. Back in the days of Daniel, the Bible said they had confusion of faces. That's exactly what we have today. Even in America, yonder in Washington, the politicians can't very well agree on anything anymore. They can't seem to get together fighting one another, let alone other nations in the world. Look at the stress today between American and ungodly Russia. 
Look what Rush has done in the past couple of weeks in shooting down that plane. Look what it's done for the whole world. Look how, look how people are greatly disturbed today. Great distress among these nations. Nerves on edge. People can't get along. Something is liable to blow up at any time. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a truthist. I'm trying to tell you what the truth is about this thing. Some ignoramus liable to get a hold of the atomic bomb and set the thing off. And set the world off in a World War Three. These are the dangers we face. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. But I know these things are upon us. And we need to be aware of them. Because God said they would come. The Bible said in Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 12. I gave you that verse of scripture. What's going to happen when the bombs begin to fall. I'll tell you we're in a terrible predicament today. We need to pray as never before for our president and our leaders. We're sitting on a powder keg. We're dealing with a bunch of barbarous people yonder in Russia. We're dealing with people in the world that, that hate their own people and do not value human life any more than the life of a dog. Listen to me. We're living in trouble sometimes. And you need to realize that. You need to pray more and read your Bible and be ready in case God should call ill will among nations. And we have that today. I have never seen a time when there's as much ill will among nations as we have today. We made a terrible foolish mistake at the close of World War II. We took what Hitler had and turned over and gave it to Joe Stalin. And you see what he's done, the mess the Russian, Russians got the world in today. If we had to use some wisdom in those days, since we only one had the atomic bomb, we could set the whole world in order and disarm the world. That's not another nation under heaven. If they had the atomic bomb in those days, what wouldn't have conquered the entire world? America is the only nation, I believe with all my heart, that would not have tried to conquer the whole world when they knew they could do so. America could very well set things in order, put Russia back in her territory, disarm the world, and set her in order. But we didn't do it. We played with that rattlesnake until now. The rattlesnake is as big as we are, and we, we probably get bit before they do. Now, we need to realize these things. You can't play with a rattlesnake. We should have killed the snake when we had a chance to do so, but we didn't do it. Good old America, we're just too good for our own good. We're just so good until we want to help everybody. And the more nations you try to help, the more you have seemingly will turn and stab you in the back. Now that's pathetic. Ill will among nations. Very integral day. Ill will today. All nations and nerves on edge today. Sitting on a powder keg. Don't know what's going to happen next. Look over here in Lebanon, the mess we're in over there. Now this is my own thoughts and you might not agree with me. I believe if America had gotten behind Israel, which went into Lebanon and said, clean her out, Israel would clean that mess out over there, and we wouldn't have had the mess we got there today. But instead of doing that, we tried to pull them back and, and try to force them to draw back and force them to stop and, and just absolutely kept on until they just had to give up. Now, had America gotten behind them, they'd have cleaned that mess out and Lebanon would have been free today. I believe that. But we played around and, and grabbed Israel by the, uh, the nap of the neck and pulled her back and said, you can't do that. you got to stop. We're not going to let you do that. We'll cut off your supplies. We won't give you any more money. And we just kept on and kept on uh, after Israel to stop and to pull back and to let up. And that's exactly why we have the mess today. Now Israel is pulled back to a certain extent and now we're begging her to go back in. I can't blame for not going back in. She was in there and could clean the mess out, but we wouldn't let her. And now we wanted to jump back in there. I don't blame them not jumping back in. I wouldn't either because we wouldn't let them do the job when they was in there. Now, that's my own opinion, but if you don't agree with me, that's perfectly all right with me. But that, that's my own personal belief about the thing. And then in the last days, the Bible said to be eating, drinking, marrying, buying, selling, planting, building. Look at Luke chapter 17 and verse 28. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built. Beloved, you can go in the average grocery store today, these big chain stores, and you look at the buggies that the people put their food in, and you won't see many of them, but what won't be about half full of beer. You have people today that's going to buy that slop, they're going to drink it, whether they have food to eat or not. They're going in when they get the ticket, they're going to buy their beer, they're going to buy their cigarettes, whether the children have shoes or not. They're going to buy these things first of all, and then if they have anything, any money left, they'll buy a few groceries, but they got to have that beer and drink of that beer day after day leads them to stronger drink 
and eventually make drunkards out of them and they eventually go to a devil's hell a drunkard's grave without God many of them. You can't keep your refrigerator filled with beer and your children going and see it day in and day out without them growing up and wanting to drink beer and later wine and, and hard whiskey and become drunkards. Beloved parents uh, need to realize that you're leading your family in the wrong direction. They're going to have that beer regardless and, and whether they have anything else or not. Got to have the beer, got to have the cigarettes, and then if there's anything left, we will take it and in, in the money left, we'll buy something else. The Bible said they were buying and selling and planting and building. That's a time of prosperity. When the Lord comes back, you'll be in the era of prosperity because you can't be buying and selling and planting and building unless you've got a little money floating around. A lot of people say, well, we're going to have a depression. When Jesus comes, nobody will have anything to eat and everybody will be on starvation. Don't you believe a word of that? The Bible said in the end time, they'll be buying and selling and planting and building and trading and so forth. And that's a time of prosperity. The devil knows if he can keep people prosperous, then they forget God. Back during the days of depression, I can recall back when I, when I was a young man and, and there was a great depression on. I was young in Greenville, South Carolina at that time and the mills were closed down. People had no work to do and they met in the church and they had revivals and they prayed. They had prayer meetings. People got right with God. They loved the Lord and looked forward to going to the house of God. Didn't have any money, but they had God. And when they began to prosper, they soon said, Goodbye, God. Goodbye, church. We have a home now. Good funny to your food. Need clothes to wear an automobile. Money to spend. We're going to take off to the lake Sunday. We won't be in the house. Goodbye, Jesus. Uh, we're glad you stuck with us during the depression, but we don't need you anymore. And so goodbye. We're on our own now. We're well able to carry on without you. That's the attitude of the human race today. In time of prosperity, they turn from God. They forget God. They say we don't need God anymore. There's some people right now that years ago would be in God's house. You know where they are now? Sitting over yonder on Lake Harwell, up yonder Lake Lanier, down here uh, somewhere uh, between here and Augusta on the lake or up in the mountains. They don't have any time for God anymore. Back when they didn't have anything, they wanted God, but now they don't need Him. They say we're getting along all right. Like the little boy, the preacher said, son, have you prayed today? He said, no, I didn't pray today. He said, why didn't you pray today? He said, well, I don't think I need anything today. And so as long as people don't think they need anything and need God, they're not going to have anything to do with him. And so we find in the last days the devil is going to see that we are prosperous and everything going well to get us away from God. And then he said there'd be rich men heaping up treasures for the last days. James chapter 5 in the first three verses said in the end time you're going to have more and more people becoming rich. There's never been a time when you have so many millionaires as you have in the world today. You'd be surprised at the number of millionaires that's become millionaires since World War II. Now they go in and then these lotteries and buy a ticket, win a million dollars. Uh, you take a couple of fellas out of the ghetto or out of the slums, can get in and get a pair of boxing gloves and beat one of them over the head for a while and then get out here and, and a, a bunch of gangsters will promote them and use them and they'll get out there and try to debrain each other and uh, get a million dollars for it. That's one of the stupid, most stupid things I've ever seen in my life. A couple of fellas out there beating one another over the head, beating them and people hollering, yelling them and egging them on. And uh, they eventually knock one out, maybe kill him. And they'll give the man a million dollars and, and say, we want you to soon uh, do that again. And we'll give you two million next time. We want you to get up there and beat one another's brains out again. We'll give you uh, three million next time. That's one of the most stupid things I've ever heard of in my life. I can't hardly stand to look at it. Sometimes when they show it on the news or something or other, those people beating one another in the head. And this last couple of weeks, I think two's been killed that way. You'd be surprised. You don't know. You don't know how many people have been killed in this so-called boxing business today. They won't let it all out. But there's a great number of people being killed every week or so in this box, so-called boxing business. And you won't know anything about it because many times some that are killed, the little, little fellas are training to do the job and they're not popular, not well known, and you don't know about it. I tell you it's brutality and I, I just don't think it, it should be done. And then people overpay them to do it and the big outlaws and gangsters many times become rich from it. Now the Bible said rich men will be heaping up treasure in the end time and when a person gets a million dollars, 
He's far more hungry to get another million than he was the first million. It's contagious. It's kind of like a disease. The more money you get, the more you want. And money becomes your God. And that's all you think about. And all you study about. All you want to do is cram some money in the bank or hide it away or, or invest it. And you get your mind off of God and all on money. There's nothing wrong in having wealth. There's nothing wrong in gaining wealth. If you get it honest, give God his part. And do that which is right. Treat your fellow man right and be honest about it. Nothing wrong in that. Abraham was a rich man and he was a great man. Joseph Amethia was a rich man. Solomon was a rich man. Nothing wrong in being rich. If you get it honest, if you give God his part, if you consider the poor and be honest with your money and don't make a God out of it, there's nothing wrong with it. Money is power. You can do great things with it to the glory of God. And then the Bible said they'll have a form of godliness and no power in the end time. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. You'd be surprised today at hundreds and hundreds of churches in America. They'll go through a little formality this morning and put on a little firecracker service in the atomic age. And they go through that little formal service and then they'll dismiss and go home. Nobody received anything. Nobody blessed. Nobody helped. The Spirit of God not there. And just went through a little formality. And want him as much as open the door of the church tonight. I want him as much as attend the church tonight. That all they want is a little formal service on Sunday morning. And they go for respectability. They say it's a good thing to do. And we'll try to use it as a fire escape out of hell. And know no more about God than a cow knows when Sunday comes. It's pathetic. We have ruled the Holy Spirit of God out of many of our services today. And that's why we're not getting more done for God and don't feel the presence of God anymore than we do. And then the next thought is, our lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 4, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. If you had all the people in the house of God today that were in a football game yesterday and last night, and had some fiery Holy Ghost preacher get up and preach hell, fire, and damnation, and could get that crowd to listen to hear the gospel, you might see things happening in America. But you had multitudes, you had millions yesterday worshiping the God of pleasure out of football stadium. You couldn't hog tie them and drag them into the house of God. And many of them got the name on the church roll, and many of them talk about going to heaven when they die, but they'll put worldly pleasures in head of God and say they love God. Not a word of that soul. Beloved, where your heart is, that's why your feet's going to carry you. And if your heart's with God in God's house, then you're going to want to be there on the Lord's day. Love is a pleasure. This world has gone pleasure man. This world has gone sports man. This world is worshiping the God of pleasure. Now don't misunderstand me. I'm not against good, clean, straight sports. I think it's good for young people. I think it's fine. I'm not against it. Don't misunderstand me. I'm talking about people that's all they think about. Those that's all, that's all they think about. All they spend their money for. And they can't think about anything else. Just sports, sports, sports. Goodbye God. We'll have nothing to do with God. We're not going to help the poor. We're not going to do anything good. But we're going to enjoy sports. And they made sports their God. And that's wrong. Good, clean sports. Fine. I appreciate the schools that have good, clean sports programs. It's good for the youth. I appreciate that. Nothing wrong in that. I'm glad about that. You know what I'm trying to get across to you is that people that's gone absolutely sports crazy and they can't wait from one Saturday to another to buy their liquor and spend hundreds of dollars and drive hundreds of miles to take a part in sports. Not one thought of God. Not one thought of coming to church. Well, not one thought of the Bible is sad, it's pathetic, but that's where we are today. And then the Bible says, great sorrows coming upon people, Matthew 28. And then there's an awful crime wave that's in the land today. Our rotten judicial system is, is turning criminals loose. These corrupt, wicked, uh, ungodly judges in these uh, federal appeal courts and all of this kind of stuff today is turning criminals loose. Is filling our land with criminals. We have a broken down, laughing stock, a joke, what we call our criminal judicial system today. And it's a sad, sad hour in which we live. If our politicians don't rise up and do something about that, we don't have much long to live as America as we know it in days gone by. It's as rotten as dirt itself. I could mention other things. The land's filled with unbelief. I mentioned this not close. The Bible said in the days of Noah, they were living in unbelief. They didn't believe old man Noah. In the days of Lot, they lived like the devil. And the fire came in the days of Lot. The water came in the days of Noah. People didn't believe it, but they found out it was true. And they died in the flood and in the fire. 
People listening to me today don't believe in the gospel, don't believe in Jesus Christ. Say, so I'll live my own life, do what I want to, not to preach that was his business. One of these days you die and lift your eyes to flames of the burning hell, you're going to realize it's too late. You should have done something about it. Yes, we're living in these last days. Are you ready to meet God? I hope so. If not, you need to get ready. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Father, today I pray that you'll take the message and use it. That you speak to many, many hearts. Lord God, I pray that help us to realize God. I pray that you'll help us to realize more seriously the signs of the time and what's coming upon us and what we're facing today. Thank you, dear God, for this people that's here in the auditorium and for those that listened in the radio listen audience. Use the message today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.